All right, hello everyone, and welcome to the final dialogue of the seminar series, Flows, Infrastructure, Citizenship in India and China. To those who were here for the previous dialogues, welcome back, and thank you for joining again. And to new guests, welcome, and thank you for sharing the space with us today. So I had described the overall intellectual aims of this. I won't repeat that today, but do have a look at our web pages, uh, based at the link for which is based in the chat box. Um, to, yeah, so today's dialogue is called Citizenship, and it reflects on how the migration and mobility of people, objects, natural substances facilitates and obstructs the constructions of infrastructure and vice versa, and of citizenship and vice versa. Like what forms of state-citizen relations arise from the state's attempts at regulating flows and infrastructures and their occasional escape from state control. So these are some of the questions that we will be um, dealing with today. Some housekeeping, the chat function is disabled for audiences, but please do uh, write out your questions in the Q&A box, and I will read them out to the speakers from there. So before we begin, let me introduce the very dynamic and interesting scholars that we will be listening to today. Suraj Gogoi is an assistant professor at the School of Arts and Sciences, RV University, Bengaluru. He obtained his PhD from the Department of Sociology and Anthropology at the National University of Singapore. He's currently working on a book project with Manuranjan Pegu titled Tribal Question and Assamese Identity, Poetics and Politics of Indigeneity. Suraj's current research engages with regimes of citizenship in the backdrop of the NRC and the CAA in India and the figure of the minority citizen subject in South Asia. He's working on two separate projects involving one is death and citizenship and hospitality, and the other is waste and racism and environmental crisis. His public writings on citizenship appear regularly in various national and international media platforms. Andrew Grant holds a PhD in geography from UCLA. His research is focused on urban and borderlands geopolitics in Asia, including studies of rural to urban migration amid state-led urbanization in the Tibetan plateau, complications between soft power and security in China's inner Asia borderlands, and the rhetorical use of cartography and satellite imagery in international politics. His book, The Concrete Plateau, Urban Tibetans and the Chinese Civilizing Machine, was published by Cornell University Press in 2022. He's currently developing a second manuscript called The Borders of Global China for the Cambridge University Press Element Series, Global China. Alexand Alexandra Delano Alonso, our discussant for today, is an associate professor and chair of global studies at the New School. Her research focuses on diaspora policies, the transnational relationships between states and migrants, migration in the Central America, Mexico, US corridor, sanctuary and the politics of memory in relation to borders, violence and migration. Her work is driven by a concern with the inequalities underlying forced migration, the structures that lead to the marginalization of undocumented migrants in the public sphere, and the practices of resistance and solidarity focused on migrants' access to rights from a transnational perspective. She's the co-founder and former director of the Zolberg Institute of Migration and Mobility, as well as a member of the New School Sanctuary Working Group. So Suraj, over to you. Thank you, Saranda. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you for the invitation and, um, uh, and for making me part of this. Uh, I'm very delighted to be here today. And, uh, also, thanks to Andrew for um, an amazing paper. I think after reading yours, I uh, could actually come back to mind and think more in relation to this dialogue. Uh, and I hope to sort of uh, engage uh, the later part of uh, uh, this dialogue. But uh, for now, uh, I'd like to sort of present uh, the thoughts that I have for now. Um, I'll be reading out um, 
my my presentation today so kindly bear with me um India has become inhabitable. This becoming presents a rather bleak picture when we consider what B. R. Ambedkar said. He said, India may be a nation, but it is not a society. It is not a society because caste is that monster that makes social life unsocial or one without communication. Ambedkar would go on to argue that without communication, there can be no society but it will remain a society of fixed laborers. India is also not shared equally either among its citizens because social reform was never the goal of this nation. It is particularly unequal for its minorities. India's largest minority are its Muslims. They are the primary targets of Hindu majoritarian politics and ideology now. If the migrant is the main object that has driven the wave of populist and racist movements in Europe, in India, that object of desire is its minorities, of which the Muslims are its majority. We live in times when we are, we, we are witnessing a continuous process of de-democratization of democracy, to borrow from Wendy Brown. This de-democratization will become materially visible when we look at the Muslim body in India today. They are treated as non-persons. They are not citizens, but citizen subjects for their rights remain suspended in both public and private life. When we turn to India's Northeast, we find different types of democratic paradoxes emerging, but the question of minority remains. There are different types of minorities in the nation. The Northeast as a space itself is a minority, a frontier, a periphery to the Indian nation. The gaze that, or the gaze which emerges and that we call the mainland at once freezes this Joan and her people. However, I'm also equally interested in question of internal minorities within the Northeast. They are central to questions of citizenship that unfold within the process of National Register of Citizens uh, or NRC. However, in a historical sense, we ought to see the whole of the Northeast as a state of exception. Territorially seen, this is, it is possible to have a different interpretation of Indian citizenship with sufficient colonial hangovers. This is my first argument that citizenship in India or Indian citizenship is also a question of boundary maintenance. With British India, there were certain spaces that were treated exceptionally. Some areas of Northeast India fell under the purview of the law that excluded them from federal and provincial legislature. Instead, it was put directly under the governor's rule. These exceptional areas were called the excluded and partially excluded areas. Such exceptional areas manufactured with the India Act 1935 must be contextualized with another colonial era law called the Bengal Eastern Frontier Regulation 1873, which introduced the concept of inner line and the inner line permit or in short ILP. ILP as a noble cartographic tool demands documentation from outsiders for entry, exit, and movement within the territories that were notified by the regulation of uh, 1873. We see here both surveillance and punishment under such a system where movement of citizens within the territory is restricted and documented. It also extends the surveillance of goods such as rubber, wax, ivory, book, diary, manuscript, map, picture, photograph, etc. Such an exceptional way of governing the territory produces very different context of experiencing life and above all, subjecthood and citizenship in colonial and post-colonial India, particularly when we see through the security regime of the Indian state. It creates grounds for direct and indirect surveillance. The colonial government was not only interested also anxious in movement of people from outside of British India to its territory, but it was also interested in movement of both goods and people internally, meaning we can also see both of them as flows, in other words, keeping the uh, context of the seminar. Different territories produce different gradations of commonalities of subjection in the colonial period. 
Moreover, it is such marking of territory in lieu of citizens' movements that for the first time animate a different infrastructure of surveillance of the state on goods and people alike. ILP as a cartographic tool enables a different or a certain kind of surveillance. Surveillance can also be seen as modes of collecting data on population or subject population according to Anthony Giddens. Collected information can be codified, hence surveyed. The territorial dimension of citizenship as border maintenance also becomes clear if we look into passport entry into India Act 1920 and the Citizenship Act 1955 itself. For instance, the Citizenship Act defines an, quote, illegal immigrant, unquote, to be a, quote, foreigner who has entered into India without a valid passport or other travel documents, unquote. The next argument I'm making here today is that the security infrastructure of India, particularly when it comes to the question of citizenship, rests on a discourse of doubt. The kind of doubt I'm referring to has to do with potential illegality of persons in the NRC process. By doubting and finding the doubtful citizens through th this citizenship process, the state is proving that their doubts are correct and such doubts can become foundations for thinking about citizenship or turning someone stateless. This doubt has been also generally applied to all populations living in a particular space and time. In Assam's NRC, the whole population of the state was doubted for which they were asked to undergo a verification of their citizenship status, although these doubts were qualitatively different for different community of individuals. If NRC is theoretically a skeptical tool that applies to all and selectively to the Muslims of Bengali origin, Armed Forces Special Power Act does the same for the indigenous population of Northeast or people in Kashmir, which doubts everyone to be separatists at one point. For instance, one of the special powers within APSFA or Armed Forces Special Power Act reads, and I quote, arrest without warrant any person who has committed a cognizable offense or against whom a, re a reasonable suspicion exists that he has committed or is about to commit a cognizable offense and may use such force as may be necessary to effect the arrest, unquote. Here too, doubt is applied to secure these quote unquote disturbed areas and one can be killed on the basis of mere suspicion alone. The burden of proof and doubt is also preemptive by nature. By nature. It is preemptive for the system and, and so, as society wants to produce more illegal persons, or in the case of Assam, illegal Bangladeshis. Additionally, the preemptiveness also indicates a certain control over doubt and how it functions. The itinerary of doubt attended by preemptiveness and control is now an integral part of state making process, which potentially involves at once the police, army, election commission, district administration, various government departments who can verify legacy documents, Assam state government, Wipro, Supreme Court, high courts, foreigners tribunals, etc. Most importantly, in this process, the burden of proof or proving that one is a legal citizen was placed on the applicant. The sifting focus of burden of proof from citizenship to the state and back to the citizen is also integral to the political history of Assam. Here I want to highlight the travel of doubt in the context of Assam. It starts with Milan's census report of 1931. In those reports, we are told that the migrants are invaders who are quote unquote vast horde of land hungry immigrants and mostly Muslims and capable of altering and destroying quote, the whole structure of Assamese culture and civilization, unquote, no less. Qualifications such as consolidated, conquest, attack, invaded, major operations, give us a refined image of the settlers and in time brought and dispersed successfully by the regional elites among its masses. Such a refined image of the settlers is used to turn them into a concern of national security in post-colonial India. Doubt also facilitates racial profiling of Bangladeshis whose metaphorical references have traveled from Assam to Delhi's Jahangirpuri. In other terms, a flow of metaphors of hate from frontier to the center. Doubts also flow 
and can create a certain group of citizen subjects, profile them, and later collectively turn them into objects of national security. We see here how the discourse of doubt, citizenship, and infrastructures of security are organically related. The gradual progression or flow of migrants from being a political and cultural problem for the Assamese nationalists to a question of national security follows a logic of how surveillance infrastructures constructed, uh, are constructed over a period of time. The last argument I have is on the category of family, as I've shown in the paper, um, that family returns to becoming a unit of citizenship in the, in the context of NRC. And uh, NRC, as we know, it, it produces or it becomes a process um, of continuous surveillance. With NRC, we also see a surplus production of doubt and a mass utilization of data that is produced through this process. Uh, all of these data now coded, standardized, and sorted becomes data for surveillance and open to mass utilization. The, the NRC process shows that citizenship is not just a pure judicial, a juridical concept, nor is it a completely given fixed social contract. It is open and linked to claims of culture, language, and above all to the, to the community at both regional and national levels. Unpacking this democratic paradox will also save us from overmining the BJP-led right-wing populism or far-right uh, populism in India as a cause of, cause of all anti-minoritarian becomings in India. Most scholarship on Indian citizenship also undermine the agency of the regional in presenting this big picture of citizenship in India. I will end here and say that minority in India are subjects or at best citizen subjects whose present and future are both open and indeterminate, exposed to all kinds of doubts. NRC makes this practically a possibility and not just a theor theoretical claim. NRC operates on a political model that is historical and is a juridical concept replete with consequences for the minorities in the future. I call this emerging juridical figure of the citizen with NRC a return to subjection, doubting and surveillance, the after of NRC. This return to being a subject disturbs the neutral, neutral freedom a citizen holds. This paper showed the lines of flight of citizen subject in contemporary India is selective and replete with violence for its minorities. A poet wrote, we won't show documents. The citizen subjects shall be forced to show documents and more. This is new India, a permanent state of exception for its minorities, where hate has become respectable and community uh, eroded. Thank you. I'll end here. Okay, I hope my <clears throat> screen is visible. I'd just like to start by saying uh, thank you to Sharanta for inviting me to participate in this. I've really enjoyed all the talks so far. And uh, thanks to the New School for hosting this. And I look forward to talking with um, Alexandra and Siraj about this. Uh, and I really find uh, some of the ideas Siraj has been writing and talking about really intriguing. So I look forward to the dialogue. So I'm gonna be talking about um, I guess citizenship between between mobility and isolation in Chinese inner Asia. This is really uh, I'm drawing from field work I've done in the uh, I guess I'd say early to mid 2010s, actually going into late 2010s as well, in uh, certain uh, parts of Chinese inner Asia, in particular in uh, on the Tibetan plateau. And I, I think you can see from this map here, this is just a map of a variety of the sites I've, I've done research in. It's a pretty wide area of, of China that I, um, I'm calling Chinese inner Asia. So really, what is it? Uh, in Chinese policy, these areas are called the, the Western region. Um, and they're typically seen as areas where there's a large degree, and this is sort of through the state lens of, of, of poverty that needs to be alleviated, as well as um, ethnic minorities. So there are places that are very 
richly diverse religiously, socially, linguistically. There are also places that are um, historic borderlands and historic sort of contested imperial places um, between a variety of uh, global empires. And there are also places that historically, from the perspective of, of China, they've, or they, they've been areas that have been subject to colonization and attempts to sort of remake them in the state vision. So I'm going to be talking about um, sort of a trying to temporalize a period of economic growth and then turn towards security that's occurred um, really over the last 20 years. So starting around 2000, there was this policy called the Open Up the West campaign, um, in which there was a large amount of money that has been sort of shifted into Western, the Western region in order to spur uh, development. And this was through having uh, the central government sort of encouraging uh, fight fiscal transfers from provinces within Inner Asia, uh, massive infrastructure development, rail development, road development, and that's brought Chinese uh, state-owned enterprise construction companies. It's opened up new places to resource exploitation. And in doing this, it's meant that there's been a real expansion, right, of circulations um, in between these areas uh, and inner China, as well as between these regions in Western China and potentially external areas, other countries, right? And the sort of the Belt and Road Initiative, uh, the new Silk Road, all of these programs have really been part of the development has been to open these places to make them bridgeheads for global development. So as one can imagine, these new infrastructures, they enable flows of people, goods, and ideas. But sometimes the ideas uh, or people carrying ideas can be seen with suspicion by the state or that uh, some of these ideas can be considered dangerous, right? So when I'm talking about this um, temporalization, uh, I think we can say that starting around in the mid 2010s, there's been a significant shift towards securitization. There's been a people's war on terror, a people's war on underground forces or underworld forces. And that uh, part of this has been to sort of, to try to, and I, I, I sort of see it as a contradiction to sort of could further control uh, some of the new mo uh, mobilities, the new uh, the flows that have been enabled by the development of uh, the economy in these regions and um, new technologies that have, have been brought in. So I'll, I'll sort of use some examples from my field work to talk about this, but in, in order to sort of set up this tension between mobility and isolation, I wanted to sort of cast this place as a frontier. Frontier is used differently in different literatures. I'm really looking at it as a uh, an asymmetric space in which uh, a more powerful entity, state entity, is trying to open up a place to colonization and development. But it's also a place in which the these uh, the state authorities have there's limits on their sort of I guess you could say degree of penetration state capacity and this is also it's also it's linked to topography and it's linked to infrastructural reach. So I'd say though at the same time this is asymmetric meaning that right in this case the Chinese state has more authority and power over what's going on in these areas by creating infrastructure and by sort of creating, um, stimulating the economy in these areas, it's also allowed there to be a degree of um, maneuver for the people that are living in these areas, meaning that there's been, they have agency in pursuing economic opportunity. They have agency in using some of the new infrastructures that have been made available to them. And they have used this to sort of refashion their lives and also to participate in this growing national urban economic uh, economic and urban citizenship in which the state is really trying to draw them into in order to create a sort of a 21st century Chinese dream and um, Chinese state. But in more recently, as there's been this shift towards securitization, it's created a lot of social confusion about, uh, and I'd say even, you know, to some degree, a sense of betrayal, but I'll, I'll get into some examples of this. So the first example I'll talk about is Sabit the Baker, um, who was someone I met uh, during <clears throat> when I was living in the city of Xining, which is the largest city on the Tibetan Plateau. Sabit was a Kashgari baker who had migrated, he had left Xinjiang, looking for a way to make money um, 
as uh, doing what he did, which was make these breads, these non breads that you can see here. Uh, and you could, this is a photo I took in Xinjiang. This isn't Sabit's bakery, but these are non breads, and there's a tanur, an oven, it's sort of a half domed oven in which you bake the breads in the top. And it's something that's really um, popular in um, cities across China. So he had cased the city of Xining. He knew how many bakers were there. There were three other Uyghur bakers in a city of about 2 billion people. So he thought he could make money doing this. He sold between two and 500 breads a day, depending on the season. He had a, a bakery in a delicacy street um, within the city. And business had been good and uh, well enough that his brother had even come to help him do this. Sabit uh, and his brother, they rented a small room um, a couple blocks from where the bakery was. It wasn't, a, it had a shared bathroom, it was sort of a shared space. But Sabit was very, um, he was very happy to be doing this. And one of the reasons was he was happy to sort of leave his family situation in Xinjiang. He thought that the form of, uh, he wasn't, he didn't, he was a practicing Muslim, but he didn't go to the mosque every day. He was facing pressure from his family. He was in um, an arranged marriage that he wasn't very happy about. And he really enjoyed living in the city and he enjoyed sort of, uh, uh, he, he had a good deal of friends uh, that were Han Chinese, that were Koreans, that were people that he could sort of hang out and be with that didn't put the religious pressure on him. He could drink alcohol and do things like this and socialize in this way. So he was really happy to be living um, where he was. This doesn't, doesn't mean that he was separated, didn't he see himself as a Uyghur. He was very proud of his heritage and what he did. And he also used, again, these affordances that had been created by infrastructure to listen to over Weixin and other apps, Arabic and Turkish music um, that he would hang in a plastic bag above his uh, baking counter. So he was someone who had really taken advantage of regional mobility in the early to mid 2010s. Um, and again, was living out of his home province. The proliferation of infrastructure that I witnessed for my first time in the late 2000s in the Tibetan Plateau to when I was last there in the, in the late 2010s uh, had allowed people to sort of engage in mobilities that they hadn't had before. People who would live in the city, but also be able to drive home on weekends um, in order to help with harvests, in order to see their families, sometimes strategizing about language learning for their children. It also allowed there to be new sideline labor that had stemmed up from, say, purchasing cars. And here I have a photo of somebody washing their car at sort of an impromptu roadside car wash. Uh, and this, so if people would go home, they would uh, take other people, they would make some money, sometimes create businesses like this. And it had also encouraged there to be return migration from Tibetans who had gone to India because of the stimulus to the economy that had occurred during this period. So one um, example is a man I knew named Tsering, whose family had in the um, sort of mid 2000s had migrated to Dharamsala to India. And he had become uh, in, in part for education and for economic opportunity, but he had returned in the mid 2010s, because as he told me, the spiritual life was better in India, but the economic conditions were worse. So now Tsering was um, working in a, in a tour agency. And he also had to have a new ID card made. And I think this really speaks to the limits of state uh, control really in these areas. I met others as well who would sort of go to different uh, townships and try to find someone who would produce a new ID for them so that they could uh, abandon the, their old ID card. And I think there was this sort of the limits to state power were something that were assumed to bother state authorities um, who were suspicious, right, of Tibetan loyalties. But I think it also was really interesting because there were a lot of jokes about this, jokes about the limits of the of state capacity really in, in these places and in their ability to sort of police the citizenry. So one example, uh, a joke that I was told of, about um, Tibetan Taliban, and you know, when I first heard this, I was like, oh my gosh, this is going to be some stuff I shouldn't be hearing. But it was really, it was a, really, it's a joke about people who are away from state capacity. So as my friend told me, 
Who are the Tibetan Taliban? They look fierce and they live up in the mountains away from everyone, but they wouldn't hurt anyone. They're Buddhist Taliban. So he told me the story about Uncle Gonbo, who was a man who got into a dispute in a grassland area and eventually stole um, someone's car who he was in a dispute with. The police came to get the car back. Uncle Gonpo refused this and ended up actually beating some of the police. And they ran, they, they, they basically fled the scene. And then they came back with more police. He was detained, but he was also actually, he had uh, sort of a, a local state position and a state salary. So he was released early. He was allowed to maintain his position and his salary. So this was a story that was told with a lot of laughter. And really it was sort of, I, I would hear other stories about the, the figure of, of the bandit. Tufe, someone who was sort of resisting um, or getting into sort of minor trouble with, with the state. And I think this is really sort of a, a celebration, um, mocking the way that the state can also be somewhat wary in trying to control places. And also it speaks to the infrastructural reach of, of the state. So I'll sort of get to the final stage of this sort of growing isolation, right? So in 2013 and 2014, there was a spate of um, terror attacks across China that had really led to uh, an increase in securitization. I witnessed this myself in the city uh, where I was living at the time. Not only would there be more security checkpoints and bus stations and train stations, but there would also be sort of mobile security vehicles that would pop up here and there. One of them popped up next to Sabit's um, Delicacy Street where he had his bakery because it was a very Muslim area. I went to talk to him and he, he asked me what the situation was like, whether it was chaotic. He hadn't left his stall for days at that point. It's too rigid, he told me, I have to keep my head low. He told me the situation uh, in Xinjiang was you know, becoming increasingly uh, difficult as well. The security... Uh, proliferation and sort of the invasiveness was becoming really common uh, and people were talking about it more. Um, Tibetans I knew were no longer able to take knives with them that they would carry on their belts. Lighters were being confiscated. This is largely related to the self-immolations. And people were feeling that they were being profiled and that this was really, uh, you know, physiognomically, racially profiled. And there could be Moments could be humiliating, and but they were also really getting in the way of intimate practice as well. So this is a photo I took of um, on the Barkhor in Lhasa, which is sort of this uh, famous um, inner circuit uh, pilgrimage circle and street within Lhasa. And here you can see no less than three different uh, institutional forces that are helping uh, or helping uh, that are controlling the, the uh, fire. Uh, which is used right for fumigation and for uh, giving offerings. Uh, so you, you know these restrictions and the way that they get in in the way of everyday life um, were, were becoming seen as increasingly invasive. And these restrictions were also mirrored in cyberspace. So when I was doing research in the early 2010s, it was very common to turn to Weixin to create groups to share. Uh, you know, for businesses, for ideas, but also to use the more the uh, public, the, the memories uh, or moments feature to draw attention to um, intolerance of, of uh, or mistreatment by the police, beatings, images, you could see images of people being beaten, but also to promote language learning and, and, and things like this. So one of the things that's happened, there's been the, you know, this, uh, I'm drawing this, there's many ways to approach this from a policy perspective, but the People's War and Underground Forces and the way that they have used this to look for quote unquote local tyrannies, Bajan, which I think is really interesting when we think about spatially about this as sort of limits of, of state control. This idea that there's people who are creating local pools of power, little places of power uh, that could be potentially related to these extraterritorial forces like the Dalai Lama. These could be sort of separatist spaces. Uh, mother tongue education that's used for nationalist separatism. So there's there's been, a, and then encouraging in this policy, encouraging people to really kind of rat on other um, Tibetans that are doing this. So this is just a, a, a image of propaganda or a, a policy poster I took in Lhasa about this. So you have then, uh, this has had a real chilling effect, right? So you don't see these sorts of things online anymore either to the same degree, sort of drawing attention to, to state abuses. So there's growing isolation offline and online. 
And I think what this really speaks to is sort of a uh, the state, um, the growing, working against some of the affordances of contemporary um, economic and urban citizenship that it had really worked hard to create and sort of going back against it as these fears of securitization have become more intense. So I'd say to conclude, isolation has become a key consequence of China's efforts to stem what it perceives as disruptive flows in Chinese inner Asia. And that by attempting to control flows of information and to police religious or political ideas accused of having extraterritorial sources, China has undercut the very promise of modern urban and economic citizenship that this development has made possible. And I think if we you know, look at some of the uh, comparisons to in, in Northeast India, we look at the way that um, citizenships have be citizens have become to be seen with more suspicion, more doubt. I think there's some good um, basis for comparative discussions. So thank you. Thank you so much, Andrew and, and Suraj, and, and hi, I'm Alexandra Delano. I'm sorry, I, I joined in a little bit late, coming right after uh, teaching and precisely uh, a course on, on questions of citizenship. So, so this ties in uh, well, and uh, I am definitely not an expert on India or China, and, and my focus has mostly been on, the, on this part of the world, on, uh, especially the US-Mexico context. And I found your papers um, really uh, generative in terms of thinking how, how these challenges to citizenship, both from the state and from the populations that are challenging these regimes in these two cases, speak to larger questions globally of the limits of citizenship. Um, and I'd love to hear more as, as we discuss, you know, how how we, we make we can make broader, broader um, broader discussions or, or take this further in thinking about the category of citizenship itself uh, and alternatives to it. So I'll just, I'll, I'll make my comments broad and ask a couple of questions that either of you can, can address in, in the conversation. But I, I wanted to start with something that might be obvious, but I think it's important to note that um, what we, we often associate the question of, of citizenship as a um, binary of who deserves rights, who doesn't, who belongs and who doesn't, thinking of it in terms of um, ac across borders, right? The distinction between the citizen and the migrant, the citizen and the foreigner. And what you're both showing is how this is not just a debate about the citizen and the migrant, the foreigner and, um, and the local, but about the distinctions of citizenship within a country within the people who already have citizenship, um, how how there are desirable citizens and others who are not desirable, and how the category of citizenship can be used as a as a form of control and um, and dispossession. Um, that the that the the category of citizenship is certainly not enough to guarantee the protection of rights. Um, and what I see as, as interesting here is that you both show that it's um, it's a question of the limits of citizenship or the or the manipulation of citizenship, both by the state and by the people. Where the 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 the, um, the challenge to it and the possibility of moving it in in one direction or, or another can come from both sides. Um, so I'd like to hear a little bit more of those about those. Uh, dichotomies, right? Uh, for Andrew, I was thinking a lot of, you know, how isolation and invisibility is a tool of the state, but can also be a tool of resistance and being outside of state control. Um, so generally, when we think of citizenship, as, as Suraj uh, outlines in the paper, re referring to, to Marshall and others, um, is this sense that citizenship protects, that citizenship gives access to rights, uh, but here, very clearly, in both cases, we see that it's, it is no guarantee of access to rights. It can be an instrument of violence. It can be an instrument of surveillance. And it works alongside regimes of discrimination and exclusion. And for me, 
in, in this sense, it echoed very closely the demands of undocumented migrants in the US and elsewhere, where they have shifted the struggle of claiming rights, not anymore in terms of citizenship. You know, their, their struggle has been arguing that citizenship is not enough. When you see that people who are citizens are being over-policed, attacked, killed by state institutions, discriminated against. So in this, this is the larger question that I wanna that I want to put to you. If citizenship is not enough, then what is the struggle about? Um, so there are assumptions of status, rights, identity, and territory um, in the ways that we understand expressions of citizenship, but also practices of surveillance, control, and dispossession, where the power of the state to control what citizenship is is manifest, and you both show how citizenship is a form of boundary maintenance, but not just outside, also within. Um, and in that sense, how does it serve competing interests of the state between economic development and territorial control, and at the same time, limiting the flow of ideas or religious expression? And here, I think what, what you both show is this um, this tension and this contradiction uh, that we see in other spaces too of offering citizenship or not and how that serves political or economic interests that are that are beyond the category of citizenship itself. So this is where I would like to to ask you to 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 tell us a little bit more and go further in thinking about the category and and the challenges to it. Um, I also really appreciate how Suraj um, introduces this idea of, of citizenship not as a given but as as doubtful, uh, as something that can be can be taken away, uh, as something that can be questioned. Um, and and I I was wondering here, you know, the the degree to which the the state can do that, and we've seen it in 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 Nicaragua recently, right? Just um, the state decided to take away citizenship all of a sudden, and but other 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 forms of of doing that that maybe are not um, as as explicit, but um, but there are many ways in which this can be manifested. This doubt of um, of citizenship, and and here I wanted to turn it around too, of thinking how the state can create that doubt, but also how how people also can manipulate that and the ability to have agency. In expressing in expressing that to some extent and and the forms of resistance that can also um, come from these spaces, you're both talking about border spaces, right? And and border spaces that can be places of of resistance, right? Where you you're both showing how these are liminal spaces where the state can, in some ways, uh, extend its control or or um, or practices that that would not be possible or acceptable in other spaces. Um, but in this liminality, other practices of resistance that I think Andrew shows some of them are also um, coming through. Um, so for, for Suraj, I wanted to ask you a little bit more to explain this distinction that you're making between the usual way of looking at citizenship as status, linked to status, rights, and identities, and how you're trying to move it to think of it as a category more related to space and boundaries. Um, so I wanted to, I, I was really interested in, in, in this, how, how does shifting our gaze to think of citizenship spatially um, open up different ways of, of thinking about it, both its potential and its limitations? Um, and in what ways does the case of India challenge this idea of citizenship as a question of boundary maintenance? Um, and then I, um, for both of you, I just wanted to, um, to point to this larger question of how can we connect this with larger discussions about the limits of citizenship and alternatives to citizenship as a focus for claiming freedoms, ways of being and belonging that are not attached to um, traditional or common conceptions of citizenship related to rights. And, and Andrew, I think you're showing us these really interesting boundary spaces where there is this push and pull across this category. Um, and I'd love to hear more about how you see this as, a, as an articulation of something something else, something outside of citizenship. Is it is it moving it into a, a, a separate space 
or or are people still working and claiming rights within within the framework of citizenship or not rights are they moving away from the question of rights and more towards other other ways of thinking about freedoms or ways of being and belonging um and finally um how can you andrew you say that um that these colonial projects in the in global borderlands, um, the, the, how this research connects to thinking about these broader uh, global borderlands and how these concepts that you offer might provide comparative potential for furthering India, China, comparative borderlands research. And I think here, you know, you, your papers very clearly speak to one another. And I'd love to hear more about where you're seeing these possibilities for comparative borderlands research or where you see the connections and the differences in the in the two um, different cases that that you're both um, looking at in different spaces, how where and how are they connected? Where are their differences? Where what emerges in the space of comparing these spaces? Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, is there a particular order how we should go about? Uh, um, no, feel free to speak whoever would like to. Go ahead, we can Sarah. reverse the order. Uh, no, uh, okay, I, was, I was saying that we can reverse the order I went ahead earlier. Maybe you can uh, start if you, if, you, if you want. Oh, okay, sure. Yeah, I'll, I'll respond to some of the, the thoughts I had. Um, maybe I'll Maybe I'll start with. Um, well, I guess I'm not sure where to start. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I I think uh, thank you, Alexander, for the comments. I I thought that one of the interesting things, you know, thinking about for me, sort of the, the limits of the state and how this is sort of spatial, is that you know thinking about these as areas that are have yeah. only more recently due to the large amount of economic development that there is a lot of infrastructure being built into these places. But that's sort of a more classic, or I don't know, perhaps like a James C. Scott sort of thing that I do have in it. But I think something else that is really interesting is the way that these new just technologies and even areas that have become recently interconnected create other other sorts of spaces that are hard for states to sort of uh, patrol, right? So like the interior of a car, the conversations that are happening, people's businesses, then cities, these things on social media. <clears throat> There's a whole slew of spaces that are created. And I think that this is really when it comes to trying to create a new form of citizenry that's supposed to be very well connected, that's supposed to have more I guess interactions, you know, living in urban environments that have really been created to look like their cities in coastal China and to really have living environments and to have uh, just sort of the same uh, kind of chain stores and expectations for language and having other migrants come in. I think it's like these, these sorts of spaces become um, quite contested, uh, which is why I think that, yeah, the sort of what is visible or invisible does become a resource. And I think that that's really important to think about is that it's sort of the unintended consequences of enabling these flows and these infrastructures, which then sort of creates the need for, I think, maybe going back to what, uh, to creating doubt about what people's, right, like, like what their uh, real investment is in being citizens. So it's like you can sort of create the thing, hope that people subscribe to it, but then when you get suspicious about what they're doing, maybe starting to then kind of step back and, uh, you know, detain people, raise suspicions about whether or not they're really, um, really are invested in the state project. And I think that that's a real, uh, dangerous thing. And I think in this current period of securitization, uh, it's something that, you know, I'm really interested if in the case of, you know, in Assam and in, in Northeast India, whether it's something similar there, whether it's the economic stimulation uh, and the new sort of IT things have really kind of led, have really helped produce some of these 
amendments to the Citizen Act and things like this. And also, you know, it being a very different context where within, I, I always think it's fascinating to read about uh, what's going on in India because it's it's like the the democratic organs seem to matter so much more there uh, than in, in, when people who are, are studying China where these things are much more read through sort of the laws that are coming down. So maybe Suraj has thoughts on this. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, and, and thanks, Alexander. I think all your comments, uh, they point towards quite difficult and important questions at the same time. Um, um, I think to take away from Andrew, um, in terms of his last point, how it uh, might play out in Assam, um, I, I, I am unable to sort of make any claim uh, in terms of contemporary politics, but um, for sure how, at least in the context of Assam, um, how insurgencies kind of shaped, uh, did use this uh, concept of Assam being turned into a colonial hinterland uh, in post-colonial India. Um, so that kind of resource extraction, biopetroleum of coal, um, and Assam is a very mineral rich state. Uh, the first oil refinery in Asia was uh, set up in, in Assam, in fact, in this place called Digboy in the late uh, 19th century. So anyway, so um, so that kind of extractive um, process and not giving back, uh, in other words, development, uh, did become a question for um, insurgency in the 80s and 90s. Um, so, uh, but yeah, I, I, I wouldn't dare to uh, uh, make any further comment in terms of contemporary trends as to how uh, development or lack uh, of it thereof uh, have uh, you know kind of added to uh, looking at you know uh, similar grounds, uh, but uh, okay. Uh, so um, uh, in terms of um, thinking about limits of citizenship, I think if we look into um, works of scholars like Joya Chatterjee, who would uh, talk about. Um, the role, of, role that minorities played in pushing the boundaries of citizenship right after partition, um, you know, I think is a very important lesson, lesson to, to, to talk about how perhaps like you rightly pointed out, you know, uh, you know, boundaries can be pushed from a position of minority, um, you know, uh, in, in that sense as well. So uh, Chatterjee shows her in, in her work that, that that was the case um, right after partition, but I, I think in terms of uh, how you know state and society has shaped over the years, and, and particularly in terms of what we call as New India, um, the agency of the minority uh, has been severely curtailed. And I don't see how um, that can become uh, something uh, in terms of qualitatively speaking, you know, uh, possible uh, in, in, in current scheme of things. But I do think that, um, um, there's one example, in fact, that I can think of where these boundaries or resistances were seen. And uh, in terms of, you know, citizenship in Assam is that, uh, so before that, I think what is surprising is that no one protested, neither the victims, uh, they are in millions. Uh, so that says a lot that not being able to protest or not voice something against such a process which is going to be arbitrary, targeted, and turn them stateless, and perhaps even you know, put them under detention, uh, speaks volume. The silence does speak, speak volume. Uh, but what is interesting, and this is what, where uh, uh, you know, one of my kind of current project, uh, it's also kind of um, uh, directed at, is to look at uh, how death is central to politics. And this is what I, realized with an RC process is that with certain um, detainees who passed away inside detention centers, when their dead bodies were sent off to their families, these families refused to accept the dead bodies saying that either you send them with an address to Bangladesh or, or uh, give them citizenship, uh, post, post, uh, you know, uh, posthumous citizenship. So, I think this pushing of this limit of uh, citizenship itself towards the claim towards posthumous citizenship, I, I found to be profoundly political. 
in in the context of NRC, and that that's the um, nearest example that I can think of in terms of pushing the boundaries. Um, um, to the question of uh, and, and the kind of the larger claim that I'm making uh, is um, uh, to think of Indian citizenship also in terms of uh, also uh, with an insistence in also uh, territorial or as, as a boundary boundary maintenance, which is not to say that it can't be thought of uh, otherwise uh, with status rights and identities, which are of course very much important uh, and foundational in fact, but. Um, uh, so, two examples perhaps uh, would kind of uh, show, apart from what uh, I've already indicated in my paper. One, uh, when uh, Citizenship Amendment Act was um, bill was tabled uh, in India and, and subsequently became a law, Citizenship Amendment Act 2019, um, the protest in Northeast was not on grounds that this act was unsecular, as it was in the rest of India, um, that it only CAA, as it is called, allowed citizenship to um, persecuted minorities apart from Muslims in neighboring states. It left out Muslims uh, from the purview, assuming that majorities can be prosecuted in their own country. You know, that's, that's a separate argument altogether. Uh, but nonetheless, the protest in Northeast was on the grounds that CAA would allow or grant citizenship to uh, Hindu Bengalis in Assam. Not that it will; it is unfair, and it leaves out a section of population. Now, that gives an indication how this figure of Bangladeshi, or the enemy, in other words, is contextualized in the case of Assam, which has to do nothing to, to do nothing with religious orientation of someone. It has to do anyone who is a Bangladeshi. So that territoriality again freezes you to a kind of an identity which is beyond religion, perhaps not without, but it is beyond religion for sure. And territory does uh, play a part even in identifying the enemy for who you are and for what end the citizenship or NRC in this case uh, was uh, kind of uh, um, initiated. Um, the second thing I think this, this I've indicated in the paper, uh, which is to show that these kind of cartographic sort of contributions of the colonial period um, enable, enables or you know, facilitates a certain kind of um, control over space even in post-colonial. And the inner line permit that I mentioned, which comes out of um, uh, the regulation, uh, Bengal Frontier Regulation 1873, um, allows you to kind of make interstate borders a site of surveillance um, only in the Northeast. And right now it is applic applicable in four, uh, three states and to some extent in uh, the fourth state. Uh, the states being Arunachal Pradesh, uh, which borders China uh, largely. Um, and then you have the state of uh, Nagaland, the state of Mizoram, and to some extent Manipur. Um, now, when an RC list was declared, all these kind of neighboring contiguous states to Assam were kind of sealed. It was as if, you know, to use the phrase, it was an apparatus of capture initiated to, you know, kind of lock them in. Um, so that again tells you how geography and these kind of uh, instruments or infrastructures of the state play a vital role in maintaining citizenship, if not citizenship itself. I think that is my argument. Uh, I think I'll just stop here. There are a few things which I haven't touched, but I, I hope that um, it, it will come up in, 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 in due, due time. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to follow up for a second, and I see we have a lot of questions, so we'll, we'll turn to those. But Andrew, um, I think just, just connecting to, to what Suraj was, was talking about now, you, you ended your remarks uh, now just saying, you know, what the danger of um, you know, creating a, a, a framework in which you have to prove what your investment is in the in the state project, right? And and on what basis would that um, investment be be determined or, or proven? And I just wanted to ask you if if you are seeing in 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 the spaces that you have been exploring in this in these border spaces that those definitions of what your investment in the state project uh, could be 
are different from other other parts, right? What what do border spaces you know generate specifically that that maybe could be changing how that equation of who deserves or who doesn't citizenship are changing? And also, you know, many um, in in some of the spaces that I work on, um, non citizens you also use it in their favor and and say no we are invested in this project look at how we are contributing economically and therefore we deserve citizenship code so just um thinking around that and, and what border spaces um shift in terms of what makes you deserving or not deserving or what makes you prove your investment in a state project in the eyes of the state yeah um well, I think, yeah, it's a good question. I, I think that some of this also speaks to sort of the, the mutation of China, but other states in the world from sort of a, you know, post sort of mid 20th century expectation of, of the boundaries of nation states and what you could be given within them. Um, and, you know, in the context of China, these border areas, um, and I would say, you know, particular in Chinese inner Asia, were places that were uh, granted a degree of autonomy under uh, the, the People's Republic of China. And this was done not only out of a commitment to sort of, you know, communist multiculturalism, but also out of a political necessity to try to hold these areas so that there wouldn't be alliances formed with uh, neighboring states. And I think that this has meant, uh, you know, there's sort of been shifts over time sort of what rights people have and you know what are the rights given to them in the constitution and how many of those rights can they actually claim and what does it look like to claim them but i think you've seen a sort of a, an effort that other uh, sort of uh, scholars of ethnic policy in china have looked at to sort of to chip away at those rights and to try to sort of um basically homogenize um, some of the affordances that you're given in these ways. And therefore, make that your expectations as a citizen should be more like they are elsewhere in China, right? That you should have a property management company that is giving you uh, the sort of services you're supposed to be given, uh, that, you know, these sorts of expectations that any urbanite would have, um, you should be able to, to have. And I think that that's something that... Uh, has led to perhaps in the long term will lead to less tolerance for things like religious difference that would have been more um, toler tolerated before and not having that quite as aligned. Um, so I, I, you know, I think for me that kind of speaks to, or I, I'm curious about comparatively whether that's sort of a global shift that you can see in these other sort of uh, empires turned nation states like in India and in Russia. I think I, I've also been interested, and this came up in the paper I, I wrote, but I, I didn't get around to talking about it with the border with Kazakhstan and Kazakhs that are attracted to China. So really, you know, I think this is quite interesting, a wealthy country. So if we think about this in comparison with other global, you know, wealthy states like the United States that would like to, which, you know, be the beacon on the hill and attract people, but at the same time act very xenophobically and are very selective about the people that they would like to have come. Uh, and and uh, and engage in all sorts of you know you know we have things like the remain right remain in Mexico policy in the United States in the UK sending people to Rwanda uh, having all these different ways that spaces are manipulated so that under international law you don't have to actually give people the rights that you've signed treaties to um, to give them like for asylum claims so I think that you know in the case of China they they have enjoyed um, attracting people. Uh, like, you know, you like I talk about bringing Kazakhs um, using sort of Silk Road scholarships, people to people connections to have Kazakh citizens come. But you also have Kazakhs that are born within China that initially were going to Kazakhstan as well, sort of in some ways almost as um, intermediaries or ambassadors of uh, Chinese businesses sort of spurring development. But then you have to, again, then look to colonial, um, you know, look to the sort of longer histories to see how these borderland populations have also often been mistreated by subsequent governments. So in periods of securitization and sort of uh, trying to consolidate these borders, these populations can be, as Siraj was saying, called into doubt. 
and also and so so you know th this has been a situation where um Kazakhs that that were being able to live across borders basically sort of some of the examples about mobility I was giving in Tibet having that almost as an international situation and taking advantage of um uh, green cards and uh, visas and things to then all of a sudden, even if they've naturalized the citizens of Kazakhstan, sort of being like, well, you know, what is your role as an intermediary between China and Kazakhstan and then them being detained when they come back into China? So I think this is a way as well that um, is a violation of, uh, you know, the rights of, of citizens internationally. So there's interesting comparative work thank you both uh, saranda do you want me to do you want to do the q a yes i'll um so there are a few questions um for both of you uh to begin with there's a question from mark frazier um to what extent is the securitization of citizenship and frontier management in china as well as india being driven by global anti-terror discourses and border control laws and technologies found in the West. So this question is to both of you. There are a few more questions. I'll read them all out and then you can answer them one by one. Um, to Suraj, why is the ILP issued only in check gates and is it a way of corruption on the ground? A more empirical question. Um, another question that is probably for both of you with an example of India though, can you say something about how groups who are able to settle in and out of citizenship based on political developments impact state behavior towards those groups? Thinking about Sikhs in India who are either loyal or Palestini. Um, there's a question for Andrew. What, does, what do these new infrastructures do to the existing populations beyond the communities who are moving in or out? How are they reacting to these infrastructures? And there's a question for Suraj. Can the NRC be looked at as an infrastructure of citizenship designed for a smooth government and the 1.9 million people excluded as an unintended consequence of that process of re-verifying citizens? Or is it an infrastructure designed to exclude that is also um, in line with the current right-wing politics. Yeah, that's what we have for now. Um, shall I start? Sure. Okay. Um, <clears throat> On the, uh, let me, I mean, uh, in no particular order, this is, uh, perhaps uh, with a question on, um, you know, sort of moving in and out uh, kind of, of citizenship based on political developments. Um, I can think of, I mean, I don't have an answer, but I can think of um, uh, this, uh, you know, sort of work by Sarah Schneiderman, who talks about Tangmi's moving from Tibet to Nepal to India based on uh, affirmative action policies uh, in respective states. Um, it, as, as a very interesting example of how flow or mobility could be uh, influenced by policies of the state. And um, I don't see any, any, any problem with, with such um, um, kind of movements and um, and if we also talk about um, Southeast Asia, we have um, Iwa Ong's scholarship on flexible citizenship or shopping for citizenship. This is, of course, the more um, uh, perhaps uh, who are not that disadvantaged, but uh, nonetheless, um, economic pursuit and you know, state policies, do, uh, you know, we have seen, seen on, on various occasions, or there are many examples as to how they might. Um, effect flows. I think that's all I can say for that. Um, on the question of uh, an ILP, um, well, I, well, ILP is not just issued in the gates. It's, it's also issued in, um, well, if you're inside, say, for instance, if you are in Arunachal Pradesh, if you're inside, you can get an ILP from the political department in Itanagar. 
You can also get ILP uh, from, um, or at least the application from, to, nowadays they are also online. You can apply for it. Um, um, and if you are flying into a state uh, where there is ILP, you, you can also get ILP in the airport. Um, so it's not just uh, in, in the check gates. I think it's, it's much more diverse than that. Uh, but what I was trying to stay in terms of ILP is that um, there are two specific, three things which are very specific to ILP um, and which still kind of goes on is that um, if you are not from that state where ILP is, you can't one buy any land or any property in that state. I come from Assam bordering and I live very close to the border of Arunachal Pradesh, just about uh, a kilometer and a half away from the border. I can't buy any land uh, in Arunachal, which is just two kilometers away. Um, and that's because of ILP. The second thing, uh, and it is related, is that what I'm trying to say is ILP is not just interested in movement of people, but also movement of goods, uh, like timber or any kind of natural products. They will be scrutinized or they will be confiscated in the border. So the kind of check is not just for people, but it's also goods. So it's a different um, indirect form of documentation and surveillance is, is my argument. Um, to Arijit, I think, thank you, thank you for the question. I think, uh, I think both. I, I'd, I'd agree that it's it's a kind of a, uh, uh, they are just scapegoats, just one point nine million people to make um, a, this a formal process and then extend to, uh, you know, um, Union of India in terms of what they're saying and um, you know, um, the NPR National Population Register as a follow up of NRC. Uh, but also at the same time, I think it, it does serve um, right-wing politics. And I think that is where um, we have to be both careful and uh, careful, but also acknowledge at the same time that there are two levels of, um, or different types of populism or, you know, uh, chauvinism we are dealing with or xenophobia we are dealing with uh, in terms of anti-minoritarian -minor politics. When it's at the state level, which has very different origins and conclusions and demands and ideology. Uh, and at the same time, you have at the center a different kind of, um, uh, you know, uh, composition of ideology and state making, uh, which also puts different, uh, you know, type of pressure and uh, on on the minority. So I think they go hand in hand. They they are very organic in that sense. They complement. Um, uh, I think I mentioned in my presentation, they compete, contest, and also complement, and maybe even opposed at times to each other. But the at the end of the day, it is um, the minority who is at the receiving end of uh, all kinds of excess of citizenship and the state. Yeah. Uh, over to Andrew. Sure. Um, maybe I'll respond a bit uh, to the, that question about terrorism. I think that uh, you know, terrorism has been sort of the global discourse or global discourse on terrorism, the global war on terrorism. China was, uh, I believe maybe it was, uh, Sean Roberts has written about this in 2002, China was uh, saying that there were weaker groups that were operating out of Afghanistan. And that has become sort of, uh, you know, these three, the three evils of uh, terrorism, separatism, and, uh, extremism, religious extremism, have, have come up a lot in the discourse about threats in the borderlands, and that these are things that sort of animate. I, I think if we think about them from the perspective of the kind of work that they can do to draw doubt about what kind of a citizen you are and what you're doing, and what are the potential actions that you could do that would be bad, then, you know, there's so many things that could potentially fall under those. So, like, you know, I had mentioned this uh, mother tongue language education and how that can be attached to um, for Tibetan language ideas of um, nationalism and therefore separatism by way of a connection to the Dalai Lama. Uh, and then, you know, you can have a variety of, uh, you know, there are, there have been real terror acts that have killed civilians in China, but you can also take a variety of other forms of um, protest and, and put those down under, you know, potentially linked to terrorism or sort of linked to extremism as well. So it actually, it, it disables a lot of possibilities for um, refashioning your identity by, you know, if you participate, if you're curious about a certain religious teaching and how also that's considered extremism. 
or if you're interested in your family uh, le learning language and, and you wish that they could be more economically successful by learning that language versus uh, Mandarin, that's harder to do. Um, so I think I think it does I think it does a lot of work, and I think it's work that really, if we think about it through securitization, it's doing a lot of work in order to put restrictions on the possibilities that new connectivities and flows that ha that have been enabled through infrastructural development. Um, as far as the question about new infrastructures. Um, and what they do to the existing populations beyond communities moving in or out. Um, well, if, if I, I'm thinking about, if I just think about sort of the, the road networks I was talking about, you know, they're, they're really, they're used as, they can be sort of seen as negative, but they can also be seen as being positives, right? So some of the people who are moving in and out, they are people from those communities because now they're, they're there's more kind of regular regional circulations and migrations that have been made possible by road development. Um, I think there's there's definitely in um, sort of in, you know in interviews and conversations I did there's lots of when new infrastructure is first being developed, often housing and things like this in townships. There's often a fear that it's going to lead to large influxes of say in in, uh, in Tibetan areas of, of Han. Chinese migrants that are going to come in and sort of demographically outnumber uh, Tibetans in the area, which isn't always what happens, but it's definitely the image of, you know, when you see all these new constructions and you don't really know uh, what's going on, you're, you know, you, you're not aware of it. It's, it's not surprising that, um, you know, a lot of people don't really know who might end up eventually living there. Oftentimes it's people from surrounding rural or pastoral areas that end up purchasing those apartments and living in them. So, but I think it, you know, it can speak to, uh, I think it kind of brings fear about the the future of, of being able to maintain a social identity and uh, sort of a degree of community sovereignty in, in these areas. Um, we also have, um... We have another question probably for both of you. What are the practices by which these communities conduct their own political education of how to understand and negotiate citizenship? And does such political education engage or assert, even if implicitly, a moral balance or is such work left to political movements and guerrilla groups? Who wants to answer that? Um, <laughs> I'm thinking how to. Um, perhaps the first part of the question, I'm not sure about the second part. Um, I mean, talking specifically from my field uh, uh, in Northeast, I think <laughs> the way nationalism, uh, regional varieties of nationalism, you know, sort of. Um, developed over time, evolved over time. Um, and and, and I'm, I'm taking education in the broad sense of uh, um, being facilitated, facilitated by institutions like say, uh, literary societies such as uh, Assam Site Tesava, which is Assam Literary Society, or you have um, other civil society bodies like student unions, all Assam student union. Um, they have played a very important and a vital role in taking this idea of foreigner in, into the midst of the masses through their writings, through pamphlets, through protests, through buns, and so on. So I think uh, in making this figure of the enemy and hence in turn protecting your citizenship very public, you know, a thing of public domain, uh, civil society bodies uh, do play a very important educative role is what I, I can say at this point. Yeah. I guess in, in, in the sort of situations or, you know, people that I was talking to, I thought a lot of, uh, you know, whether it was these examples of people getting ID cards made or, you know, even people who, uh, you know, f fleeing China to India and then returning and having ID cards made. Um, 
a lot of word of mouth about both how to, how to leave the country, but also how to get back in, you know, talking to a former uh, uh, classmate or a family member about, you know, where you could possibly go to get an ID card made. Uh, this is something that's, and what are, what are the dangers of doing so? <coughs> Um, you know, a discussion about uh, this getting harder and harder to do or the needing to pay uh, another amount of money to delete your old ID card so that because if you were stuck, if you were found to be in the system twice, that would be uh, really create a problem for you being things that were much more sort of word of mouth. I'd say in the case of people who were naturalizing as citizens in Kazakhstan, that's actually a Kazakhstani policy to encourage people to return migrate to Kazakhstan. Um, from Mongolia as well and, and other places where um, Mongols, people who are ethnically Mongol were living. But then again, learning about how to kind of go back and forth and using green card, uh, using different documentation is something that people would share with one another. It was also something that was quite responsive to what the policies were. You know, if things tended to be opening up and you heard about things opening up, sort of taking advantage of that um, as it was happening, but always sort of being uh, you know, always anxiety that on the horizon that something could change. And I think that this is when I was speaking to about the, the sort of Belt and Road Initiative and its relationship to mobility with Kazakhstan, this really being even for the Kazakhstani citizens that wanted, had been enticed to do business in China. And then to have uh, the border closed even beyond the duration of COVID-19, um, this being sort of a thing where it seemed very arbitrary that you could think that you could build a life and have sort of this binational uh, future living in both countries. But then, you know, if it could just quickly be taken away. And I think, you know, maybe this is a big danger to uh, the protections of citizenship all around the world today, that if you can have states that are engaging in demaking and decreating citizenship just as easily as they could be granting it or granting it with great difficulty, but it being something permanent, right? It's like being tenured. Um, and then having those uh, rights taken away is something that I think is a real challenge in the future for citizenship. I was also thinking, you know, um, in comparison to like the Indian case that Suraj is talking about, um, I'm wondering, uh, Andrew, if like you can tell us about the infrastructures put in place to monitor Uyghurs and Tibetans. Like, what are those infrastructures? Are they meant to de-citizen them, like through biometric cards and detention camps and NRC type things that um, Suraj has made us aware of in the case of Assam uh, regarding Bangladeshi, the, the the whole, you know, idea of the Bangladeshi immigrant. Or are they meant for the opposite, to mold and discipline them into certain type of citizenship and loyalty? Yeah, it's it's a great question. It's a big question. I, I guess I'm, because I haven't had the opportunity to do firsthand field work um, since 2019, um, I'm hesitating to some degree. There's been a lot of great scholarship by, uh, you know, people who, who study Xinjiang looking at, uh, as well as in Tibet and talking about like the grid management system, looking at the different technologies that have been put in place, uh, whether it's biometric, what, you know, there's iris scanning, uh, taking blood, building, you know, uh, databases and accounts on things like this. And then um, using that to police where populations can move to and where they can't move to. Uh, and then of course, ending up in camps that right, uh, scholars like uh, Darren Byler um, in particular has written about the degree of sort of uh, efforts to change people's mentality um, that has gone on by, you know, treating people very inhumanely and also the homestays and the marriages and things like this, where it's really trying to uh, change you know, at sort of a deeper ideological level, like change people's mindsets in a more totalitarian environment and how dehumanizing this is. I think in, in the period when I was there, I, I was seeing, and I'd say in, in interviews I've done with people that live in 
Kazakhstan uh, today that have had relatives, you know, this has been something that they've uh, having the, their families' phones confiscated. I know a lot of people have deleted their accounts on social media because they don't want to get entrapped in any sort of a uh, thing. Right, stopping people checking their social media accounts has, has become a, a significant thing as well. So these things have all happened, and I, I think it's a lot. A good deal of it is to it's. I guess I've been looking at it more as as an effort to remake and, and to discipline populations in ways that are very totalizing. I certainly witnessed an increase in, in the anxieties about just sort of, you know, again, having these opportunities opening, there, there being a lot of uh, people planning about opening a business here or living there. And then as sort of the uh, security things pile up and the anxieties about using um, various technologies or being in certain places, right, getting um, having police come if they have too many people meeting in an apartment that they, just to talk about something that really wasn't, they didn't consider political at all. Uh, this really sort of over time feeling like pressure and it having a chilling effect. So I, I think that there's um, some of it is very high technology, but some of it is really uh, just if you're continuously encountering a form of harassment that having a, a chilling effect. We have time for one last question. Um, considering what is going on in India and China, especially the Muslim community in both the countries, why is our Western countries who are allies of both, why they don't have the same response towards them? Sir, could you say that last I'm part? I'm not sure about, yeah, not that clear. So the question is that considering what's going on in India and China with regard to the Muslim community, um, why are Western countries not responding in the same way to both India and China, considering that they are allies to both the countries? I read it as something like, why are Western countries not treating its minor um, or Muslim population in their own states in the similar manner as India, or China, India and China are doing? Is that the question, um, or is it? I the think I US think it's is, more like no. why is why is the Western response to India's um, uh, decitizening and oppression of Muslim minorities? not the same as the West response to China's oppression towards Uyghurs. You know, both Uyghurs and Muslim minorities, they're, they're both Muslim, but the response of the West to both of these cases is quite sort of different and contradictory. Um, I mean, this is about geopolitics. Yeah. Well, I, I think that, you know, I can't speak to the Indian case, but uh, I think within U.S. politics, the the push to disengage with China and the you know the Sino-American economic rivalry has uh, created more concern for human rights issues in China. I don't know if the real reason. Marco Rubio is so interested in issues like the situation of Muslims in Xinjiang is because of, uh, you know, I guess I interpret it through just sort of an anti-China, anti-communist lens, that that's where some of the political concern is coming from, which, which is often selective in what the politicians choose to invest in. I, I'm not sure about in India, because, you know, there's been similar issues uh, or, you know, uh, issues for decades that don't always have a lot of political attention. So, in China, uh, I'm, I'm really don't I don't I don't have an answer to this. I'm sorry, yeah, oh, I'm not sure. Yeah. I think um, I mean, there's been a lot of thought about why uh, the West is sort of allowing what's going down in India with the Muslim minorities um, and to uh, 
some extent with Christians, with Dalits. I mean, every, all, all the sort of uh, Hindutva nationalism and the fallout of that on all kinds of minorities that we're seeing and why the West is sort of going soft on it. Uh, my, I, I think it has a lot to do with China actually because the West requires or, or, or thinks, it perceives this, this ally in India against China in that region. Um, and so, you know, there is sort of a lot of space for the Modi government to do what it is doing because um, it's kind of like in opposition to China, which the West requires, or, you know, probably something of that sort. Uh, well, we have come um, to the end of our time. So I would like to thank uh, both the speakers, Suraj and Andrew and Alexandra for really wonderful thoughts. Um, I have so many questions, but um, I haven't had the time to present them to you. It's been really wonderful, this entire series, but also today's last dialogue. Um, it's been very insightful. I've learned a lot from all of you. And I hope we can continue these dialogues in the future outside of this space or maybe recreate this space. Um, thank you to all the audiences throughout the four dialogues and today for your, um, for your audience, for your engagement. Thank you to the wonderful speakers that we've had. It's been really a great enriching experience. And with that.